the ultimate methods of a man is not where he stands in moment of comfort but where he stands at a time of challenges and controversies good evening to respected chief guest my dear student managers and all the dignitaries present here i am swapna sandeep from rival alaknanda of sri balaji society it's a honor for me to introduce our guest dr om deshmukh senior director analytics solution and data sciences innovation with invested yodle sir completed his graduation from the birla institute of technology and data science and after graduation he opted for post graduation in electrical and computer engineering from boston university and just after master sir did phd in the field of computer engineering from university of maryland park college sir is recognized as one of the top 10 data scientists in india proven track record a strategy of execution of data driven products in retail banking wealth management contact center e learning domains and sir also initiated and led ibm's billion dollar global strategy on analytics for personal personalized learning sir currently working with investnet yodle and currently sir has been granted around 50 patents and also 50 plus international publications sir now i request sir to come on stage and enlighten us with your great thoughts and experience so first of all so much for showing up in such great number this is this is really nice uh and this puts a bit of pressure on me also in the following way loosely speaking and i did the maths before i came here because i can't do maths on my feet um so loosely speaking if there are about let's say 1000 of you here i'll give and take a few uh and loosely speaking if i have to talk or if we have to have this interaction for about 90 minutes uh then that's like 15 1500 hours of cumulative time roughly speaking uh, if i round it off to let's say 1600 uh and let's say on a weekly basis 8 8 hours a week 5 days in a week that's 40 hours of a week that's 40 weeks roughly is that is that correct calculation did i miss anything here no right that is the amount of time that we are all going to spend together if it was just one one person working that's a lot of time right so what i want to do is make sure that we do justice to the amount of time that we are going to spend together both ways you learn something from me and i also get to learn something from you is that a fair deal good thank you that that's one thing i and i would like everybody to keep that in mind when they are talk when they are coming on a podium talking to anybody be it one on one or be it in a lecture like this that the time is of essence and when you get a group like this together that time becomes that much more valuable because there's a group that is coming that is sitting here yes. yeah thank you and we have this here okay so uh this is this is the title of the talk that i came up early in the morning uh this morning actually when i was trying to figure out what all i have to cover and what the dialogue should be like right so i'll tell you in a minute why 20 years also uh, is ish jot here and is shrushti here oh good so they know this so please keep this to yourself uh, and thank you so much for helping me through you know giving me some context about what the audience will be like and also thanks to all the faculty members who who have talked to to get a context of what this dialogue should be okay uh which way do i point for the, for this to move okay good so so the agenda for today's talk is i'll talk a little bit about my journey so far uh, and that you know that's the hint for 20 years then i'll talk about data analytics uh hopefully what you heard from my introduction uh, is that data analytics is the only thing that i am relatively reasonably good at so i'll try to talk a little bit about what data analytics is uh what you know what what the industry as a whole is doing with data analytics what you all can expect uh, you know when you graduate or as you figure out what you want to do in the next 2 years and and so on and then there are some learnings uh, again i don't think uh, i'm qualified enough to talk to you about my learnings uh, but this is an attempt uh, in terms not so much about what you should learn but something that i have learned from my own mistakes what i have seen some of the employees who join my team uh, the kind of things that i would have i would have learned them to i would have liked for them to have learned 
before they join and so I will try to share those. Uh, I think I have distilled about three of those learnings but there are you know maybe five or six. So if time permits, if there are questions we can delve into some of those also, yeah, okay. Okay, so my journey so far, um, this is 2019, 1999 which is 20 years ago is when I finished my uh, B.Tech, yeah. And when, when we were finishing our B.Tech, uh, there wasn't Google, there was definitely no smartphones, uh, there was hardly any internet connection. I mean, we had VT hundreds. Do you know, does anybody in this room remember or know what VT hundreds are? <laughs> no, nobody? No. Okay, so VT hundreds are dumb terminals. They are just terminals, right, they are a computer screen, which is then connected to some sort of a server. Uh, and those are like really extremely slow machines. Uh, and that was our only gateway to the rest of the digital world. Right. And so our way of communicating with the rest of the world was no Quora, no LinkedIn, no Google, things that, that you, take, you and I take for granted these days. And so in our third year, the big question that we all had was what should we do now? We've learned a reasonable amount of uh, electrical engineering or in my case it was triple E, so electrical and electronics engineering. Many of my friends had done CIS chemical engineering and you know variety of different disciplines and so the question we had was what should we do uh, as a third year ends in the fourth year should we do GRE should we do GMAT should we do CAT should we sit for campus interviews uh, where should we do our internship and and so on right so our only source of information at that point was our seniors some amount of email connection that we had through our through the VT hundred uh, and so on, right? I still remember we used to write uh, quite a bit of emails on paper first because we used to have only half an hour of time, you know, at the uh, at the computer center. Type those emails. For we were not even, you know, used to typing on the on the keyboards uh, that quickly. And then wait for our seniors to then tell us what is to be done and and so on. Right? The reason I'm I'm telling you this story is you all should feel blessed that you have access. To information a lot more today than what we had 20 years ago and 20 years is not you know, is not that long ago it is just it's just 20 years so the world has progressed quite a bit from a digital connectivity perspective the access to information that you and you and I have today is infinitely more than what it was just two decades ago please use that that, ac that access to information judiciously. You can, there is no starvation of information. There is, on the other hand, drowning of information. So what I'm encouraging you all to do is not to get drowned in that information. Figure out what information is of value to you. Distill that and make sure that that information really is consumed the right way. And then, so, you know, based on a lot of back and forth with a bunch of seniors, with a lot of my batchmates and so on, uh, I decided that I should continue in the same field uh, and go, go for higher studies, which means not do CAT or not do GMAT and, and so on. So, oops. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you will do this? Okay, thank you. So, I'll, I'll tell you when. So, then I did my master's in what today gets called as data learning artificial intelligence, all of these these words pretty much get used uh, interchangeably. By the way, how many of you know at least one of these words? Show of hands please. Artificial intelligence or machine learning or data science. So there are a bunch of people who, who haven't heard either of the words. Okay, so there are some people who haven't heard. Uh, okay, that, that's, a, that's a good sign. Uh, in the sense that there is not much pressure on the data science community uh, as, as I thought there is. Because if everybody has heard about the word, then everybody is expecting something or the other from that technology, right? So anyways, so when I did that in 99, 99 to 2000, it was uh, speech recognition uh, using different kinds of machine learning models for automatic speech recognition. Then I went to a higher ranked university, uh, University of Maryland College Park. Uh, for my PhD, 
Uh, I did that PhD again in automatic speech recognition, uh, but then also in the area of speech recognition, speech enhancement, uh, when the speech is corrupted by different kinds of noises. One example is, you know, while we are talking, uh, if the if the uh, if the fans start making a lot of noise, or if the door opens and some big crowd comes in, that's a noise. The one the fan noise is called white noise. The the noise of people talking is babel noise. Very kinds of noises. The way they interfere with with the content speech is very move these two noises was the part of uh, part of my PhD work. Then uh, I did a postdoc for about nine months, and the idea was if I can use this kind of speech enhancement, speech recognition techniques, and apply them to people who have uh, hearing impairment, so people who have either hearing aids or cochlear implants. Uh, remember, this was back in 2004, 2005 time frame. The technology hadn't as advanced as much as it has today, and so the idea was, can we use these? these new technologies that, that me and my professor had built for people who have uh, hearing implants, hearing impairments. The reason I say that is for six, seven years, I had worked largely in the computer science area, computer science engineering area. And then suddenly when the postdoc opportunity came, it was in speech and hearing sciences department. So a total shift going from an engineering field to a speech and hearing science field or, uh, driven by the biological side. But the point that you should take, uh, take home from this is that a technology that is built in one area has applications in more than one area and so people have to be open to, uh, to trying to figure out what the applicability is and then make sure that, that the application is as broad as possible. Yeah? So then I did a postdoc, came back to India, joined IBM research, Xerox research, and now, currently, I run the data sciences group for Yodley. A lot of machine learning research has gone into a variety of different things that, that I have done in IBM research, uh, then in uh, Xerox research. Over the past three years, what I do at Yodley is, how many of you have heard of Yodley, by the way? Not, nobody? Nobody? Okay, good. So, let me explain that. So, Yodley is, is a uh, PFM uh, fintech company personal financial management uh, company, what it does is it helps individuals like you and me uh, do a better management of your personal finances. Which means if you have taken a personal loan, if you have taken some sort of a, a home loan or auto loan, what are the ways in which you would want that loan to be repaid? What are the ways in which your financial wellness, just like we have our physical and mental wellness, there is a financial wellness also. What are the ways in which you can progress in that journey of your financial wellness? So, Jordly provides solutions uh, which cater to, uh, to PFM or personal financial management. And as part of that, what I also do is deliver data science driven projects on a daily basis. And I'll talk about that you know, as we get into the depths of what data science means, what data analytics means, and hence what does it mean to deliver solutions on a daily basis. Okay. In the process, I've been blessed to uh, to be recognized as one of the top top ten data scientists in India. This happened. This happens uh, every year. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was in 2017, uh, and and the recognition was not just for the research that I do, but also for delivering the the kind of high end research that we do for an end solution that gets into the hands of millions of users. In the process, I also have a bunch of uh, papers and, and publications. Next slide, please. Okay. So now I talk to you about the last twenty years of, of what I have uh, what I have done. Right now, let's take a, a bigger view of what all has happened in the world over the past few decades. Can you all read read what is on the screen? Right. Okay. So airline industry. It starts with the airline industry and goes all the way down to a, a game called Pokemon Go. Yeah. And the way this is arranged is the amount of time that it has taken for each of those entities to go from zero users to 50 million users. Fair? So starting from zero users to about 5 crore users. How, how long does it take? What I want you to see is that airline industry 
took about 68 years to go from 0 to 50 million users. 68 years. Yeah. The next is automobile industry. It took about, you can't see this on the screen, but if you go to this website, uh, then you will, you will get more details also about this. It took about 60 years. So 68, year, 68 years for, or let's say 70 years for the uh, airline industry to get to 50 million users. About 60 odd years for the automobile industry to get to 50 million users. Of course, it happened many, many years ago. And then internet. Can you see it? Well, actually, let me make that a pop quiz if you are not able to see the answer. How many years do you think it took the internet to reach 50 million users? 7 years? Good. The answer is 17 years. But, but I am glad that you guys are giving the answer which is in the range of 10 to 20 and not in the range of 60 to 70. Very, very, very important. I can't overstress how important that big shift is. 60 to 70 years for something that we have been using that we take take as second nature. Right? I mean, cars or automobiles, we take as second nature. Who wants to walk or who wants to take a bullet cart these days? Right? We do Ola, Uber or taxi or your own bike or car, right? That took about 60 years to go from 0 to 50 million. Internet, which we also take as second nature has taken only about 15 to 20 years to get to 50 million users, right? Now come to the third level, which is let's say Facebook or WhatsApp or WeChat. How many? Somebody said one year. Who was the first one to say one year? I heard it from here. Fair, you know, that's a, that's a good estimate. Again, what has happened is the order, there is a drop of over an order of magnitude. 60 to 70, for let's say 100, gone to about 15 to 20, that's like 10, and then now it's one year. What that means is that, uh, it means multiple things. I, I'm not going to uh, belittle the ones that I'm not going to talk about, but in the interest of data analytics, what it means is that the technology is not only developing at a high rate, but it is also being accessed at a much, much higher rate. Is, is, that, is that clear to you all? I mean, can you appreciate the magnitude of what has happened here? Right? Things that we are taking as second nature took 60, 70 years to get to only 50 million users. The next thing that we've taken as second nature took 15 to 20 years. The third thing, WhatsApp has become a verb, just like Google has become a verb, right? We don't say go go search for it, we say go Google for it. Like that we don't say, typically we don't say go text this to me, we say WhatsApp it to me. So it's become a verb. And that's taken one year to get to more than 50 million users. Actually not even, not even a year, it's less than a year. Yeah. So the virality of any new technology or any new disruption in our life, the, the amount of time that it takes for that particular new technology to become viral is shrinking, not linearly, but exponentially, and that's that's huge, yeah. Why am I saying this? Next slide. Oh, should I do this? Oh wait, go back. Oh, I missed it. Okay. Uh, okay, there's there's a bit of a confusion. So the what stands at the center of this is data analytics, and that's why it's very important that you all. Really, if there is one takeaway that you take from this entire conversation, I would like for that one takeaway to be that data analytics is today hitting every part of our life. Every time we interact with even physical world, not just the digital world, there is some element of data analytics that, that we are interacting with. And I'll give you some examples um, as, we, as we go along. Yeah, I would like to like for this to be an uh, interactive session. I see some people nodding off, some people dozing, but that's okay, that's cool. Uh, as long as the majority of you are awake, you know, I'm happy. Uh, so please, if there are any questions, I would request some of the volunteers to pass around the mics or just shout out if there are any questions. Yeah? Question? No? Okay, good. Please interrupt me. I would love for this to be an interactive session. Yeah? 
Okay, so data analytics is at the center of this virality of what we see happening across the across the world, across different uh, kinds of domains. Yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. Actually, you know what? I'll do this myself. It makes it makes it more uh, it makes it easier for me. Okay, so from a data analytics landscape perspective. There are three main uh, there are three main pillars that are causing this kind of a disruption. Can anybody guess what these pillars are? One you can obviously see see on the board uh, on the on the slides. Yeah, computing, computing. Okay. Uh, okay, good. That's a databases. Okay, very good. Yes. Say that again. Data mining, uh, that's a buzzword. Uh, good, I'm glad you know the buzzword. But do you know, can you can you abstract it out, out to, to, a, to something more tangible? No, Wait, one second, one second, no. That was computing somebody said, but good, good. So you know data mining also, that's good, yeah. Yes, that is that is data mining. Very good. Okay, so there is some amount of deriving information. Okay, there is one other piece that is missing. Is there again? Yes, good. So that is this data, right? Exponential growth in the data. Very good. So, uh, unfortunately, now you guys have stolen my thunder. You already know all the three components, but that's good. That, that makes my job easier now. I can just walk you through what all has changed. Very important to know that the, the data analytics as an industry is becoming all permeating not by itself, but there is an ecosystem that is also growing around it. And that ecosystem is now self-feeding. What that means is as data analytics becomes more and more prominent, the rest of the ecosystem becomes prominent, which then feeds, doesn't eat out of data analytics, but feeds back into the data analytics and hence it becomes like a self-growing thing. Yeah, very important things. And thank you so much for giving all the right answers. So let's see, let's see some of those in detail. The first one, somebody mentioned diversity of data, somebody else mentioned data. So that's the first very, very important component. To do data analytics, what you need to begin with is data right the more diverse the data the more valuable the analytics will be one extreme case i'll give you is and i'm making this example up let us say i see million or 10 million data samples for a particular uh, so let's say for a particular problem of detecting a human face whether it's a man or a boy so, okay and so i look at 10 million samples but now imagine that those 10 million samples are the same face repeating over and over again. Is that valuable? No, it's not valuable, right? I mean, I'm giving you an extreme example just to make the point that data has to be diverse, right? And today what we see is that the data that we are getting is ginormous amounts as well as it is diverse. Yeah. US Library of Congress which is supposed to be the biggest collection of data, physical data, is 15 terabytes. Okay, it's 15 terabytes. Now, that's an absolute number. On a relative scale, where do you think it stands compared to the data that we generate, generate, that we generate on a daily basis? Can you guess? So, if 15 terabytes is the entire amount of data that is present in US Library of Congress. On a daily basis, how much new data do you think we are generating digitally? Any guesses? I heard lots. It's a good answer, but I need to hear something more uh, quantitative. Millions, millions of millions times more than 15 terabytes on a daily basis. To give you one example, Twitter, everybody knows Twitter, right? Okay, good. 
which suppose the, the reason I picked Twitter and not WhatsApp or Facebook or email is Twitter has a limit on the number of characters that you can type. It was initially 140 odd, now it is 250 odd or 280 odd, some such, right? So even with that very small amount of data that one tweet is allowed to have, back in 2013, on a daily basis, Twitter was generating 8 terabytes of data. And again, the reason I chose 2013 and not today's data is back then, images weren't as, as popular as they are today, images or short videos and, and so on, right? So it was all purely text data, which doesn't take up as much space as uh, multimedia data would. So back then, we had about half the Library of Congress data being generated, newly generated on a daily basis, right? So that's one very important thing that you should know. This is just Twitter. There is Facebook, there is Google, there are emails that we write, there are SMSs that we get, there are data that we scan and, you know, just all sorts of things that we do, yeah? Okay. Now, you may say, okay, but that's that's just one thing. Why do why should I be worried about what is happening in the future? Maybe that data is going down. That's a fair question, right? I am only taking a sample in at one point in time. This is again very important. If you want to think like a data analyst, you have not just think about point in time, but you have to also think about what may happen on a time scale. It may be that something is going down. And then even then the value may be high, but it's going down, so in the future the value is not much. Or it is going up, and hence the, the big value today will be much, much bigger uh, tomorrow. Yeah. So, the next question that you want to ask yourself is, is the data easy to generate? And the answer is a resounding yes. Not just because we have many, many more smartphones coming in. Everybody agrees. Does everybody agree that the number of smartphones that we are getting is going up on a daily basis, monthly basis, right? Okay, good. So the so the ways in which data gets generated is also increasing. The ease with which we do it is going up. Everybody agrees. But there is an even more compounding uh, compounding proposition here, which is I don't know if you can read this, but it is Internet of Things. How many of you know about Internet of Things? Good. Many of you know this. Because I saw that hand go up first. If you don't mind, just explain what you know, what you, what you, what your interpretation of IoT is. In the meanwhile, everybody else who also raised the hand, think about what you want to answer. I may come randomly to one of you guys here. By the way, it's a it's a buzzword, so it's important that you not just know what it is, but also understand the uh, what it means. Okay, there's some technical issue here. We'll come to this. Okay, no, go on. Yeah, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Uh, earlier, it was IOP, that is, Internet of People, in which people at a large used to connect with each other right. via phones and um, uh, simply cards and all, a fax, you can say. In uh, today's scenario, IOP has been changed to IOP, Inter Internet of Things. Uh, I can give you examples like RFID, radio frequency identification, fast sex, what is run, phones, emails, in which uh, the whole group has become a, a village rather, in which people can communicate the message very easily and compatibility. So this is what IoT all about. Very good, very good. I'm glad you know. I'm glad you give that answer. Anybody else here wants to add to what you said? Yes. You know, it will be helpful if you also, also announce your names. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'll remember your name, but at least it's a good thing to do. Yeah. Very good evening to you, sir. Good evening. I read somewhere that uh, within five years, 50 billion devices are going to connect to internet. So there would be lots of data which is going to release in the market. And uh, internet of things is all about automation. So with lots of data being released in the market, there we need people, we need uh, companies to control and uh, to keep the, uh, those data. Uh, for the benefits of people and for the organizations as well. So, uh, Internet of Things is all about connecting things, whether microwave, whether whether we talk about the dough, whether we talk about anything. Nice. So, nice. this is yes. what IoT is. Yes. Thank you. Good, good. Okay. Uh, good, good, good answer. So, yes, IoT is IOP, but without the people in it, which means a seemingly innate object will communicate with other seemingly innate object, you know, and the communication will be different 
based on time, location and a variety of other things. I will give you one very simple example and, and you know, I mean, we can think about many many examples and but I will give you one simple example that hopefully many of us have seen. When I have my mobile data on and my Wi-Fi on, on my phone and when I am not in the reach of my home's Wi-Fi connection, the mobile data kicks in, right? When I go home, I don't have to do anything. There is no person involved, my mobile phone automatically switches from the mobile data connection to Wi-Fi connection. So there was some communication between the phone and my Wi-Fi router. That's a very, uh, relatively speaking, dumb example of IoT, but that is happening today. Now there are, like somebody said here, there are many, many more intelligent examples where without any human being coming in there is a communication that is happening and things are being done in what is called frictionless way. So IoT is helping do a lot of things in a frictionless way yeah? and that is another huge source of new and diverse source of data being created. Yeah? Okay. How many of you know of Tesla? Good. Very, oh good, oh wow, very nice, okay good. So yeah, so that's another good example of, of what, you know, what IoT is doing. Okay, good. Is that all, is that all for data, for, for me to make the claim that digital data is growing exponentially? The answer is no. What is missing? Can, can somebody guess what is missing in this, in this stack? Say that again. Did you see my slides? <laughs> okay, good. Yes. So the answer is I may generate data, but I have to have a way to disseminate that data to somebody, right? And that is where you need to have easy to disseminate ways to disseminate the data easily, right? And thanks to Geo and Airtel and everybody else, we have 4G and 5G and so on, and we also have Wi Fi coming in, right? So all of these things put together. We have many, many more sources in which, through which data is being generated. We have many, many sources through which we can pass that data to n number of different groups, n number of different devices. And hence, the sum total is that the data is growing exponentially. Right? Okay. Don't, there is a quiz here. Wait. Okay, good. Wait, wait, wait. So, based on, if you all were paying attention to what I was saying, here's a pop quiz. I'm making the statement, 90% of the data in the world was generated in. So, today, if the data that we have in the world is 100%, I am making a statement that 90% of that data was generated in the last XX amount of time. Somebody said something here. Four years? Three years? Decade? One month? Okay, good. Two years? Yeah. So the answer is two years. Yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is now think about this, right? Go home and ask your parents or your friends who are not in this room. Will they say two years? 90% of the data. I am talking about 90% of the entire data that the world has today. And not a one, not a single person here said 20 years, 30 years or any such. The, the biggest amount I heard was a decade from somebody here, right? And the smallest was a month. I, I really want you guys to take a pause and appreciate how you yourself have come to the conclusion with only 10 minutes of me telling you something very superficial. Like, I mean, we have not even gone into any details of, of how the data is being generated and so on. Right? Okay, so good. This is, I'm, I'm glad you guys gave the answer that, that you all gave. Okay, so yeah, it's in the last two years. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing, right? Good. But that's only one part of the story, right? And that was one answer that everybody else gave. There was somebody else right in the top who said the second uh, interesting thing is the uh, somebody mentioned here. No, somebody mentioned here, right? You talked about data mining and so on. 
See, when we have a lot of data, uh, typically if you go to a, a, a government uh, office, they have lot, they have stacks of papers. Right? They have, I mean, they have all the records from last 30, 40 years ago and, and so on, right? But is that data really usable? How many of you say it is not usable? I say it's not usable. It's not. Right? Well, not many of you say, but I believe it is not usable because it is lying somewhere that only a particular, uh, you know, big shot officer who knows that setup will be able to mine through. Okay? But that's not the case with digital data. Anybody can access it. It's very, very difficult to get rid of it because it's very easy to copy. Physical data, I'll have to go to a photocopy machine, copy it, keep it somewhere, make sure that it doesn't get wet and you know, all sorts of things. Digital data, I can just BCC to 100 people. Nobody will even know who I CC it to, right? But what is important is that that data is, there are now techniques which are coming up which will help you do data mining. Somebody was talking about that here. And then somebody else mentioned something similar on this side also. There are ways in which you can now model that data, get information out of that data. What is even more interesting is that those modeling techniques are being made accessible. What I mean by accessible is about a, till about a decade ago, a lot of these techniques were built by a few groups and those groups would keep it to themselves. It's only over the past 10, 20 years that these groups have said, we will open our modeling techniques. We will make it open for the world to use it. And why is that important? That is important because if let us say a university like Balaji, Balaji Institute starts data science today, if it was starting to 20 years ago, they would have had to start from scratch. They would have had to build the very basic data science model first then slightly advanced version, then more advanced and so on. That is not the case today. Today, when a new group starts data science, they absolutely will have to learn all the basics, but the systems don't have to be built from scratch because there are Git repositories where people have made their years and years of learning open source. You can just believe that that is right and start building on it. How many of you know about Git here? Okay, some of you know, right? People especially who are aspiring to get into the data science side of it, more on the engineering side, I would very highly encourage that the first thing you do, well, the second thing, I'll tell you in a minute what the first thing is. The second thing that you should do tonight before you go to bed is look up what Git is. Yeah, please make a note about that. The second thing is, Big companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, they are also making their years of investment in machine learning, data science, data analytics, open source. And they're not just making it open source in a, in a way that only, only people who are trained can use it. They are making it open source in such a way that people who are just beginning to learn data science or business analytics or data analytics can start using it. So the bar that you have to cross to start using data analytics is going lower and lower, which is a, a very good thing because then that, what that means is now you can advance the technology a lot quicker and a lot more. Yeah, very, very important. That's the second important reason. Clear? Questions? No? Okay. Third. Right. It's easy, and I think somebody mentioned about the compute power. The person here mentioned that, right? So who mentioned computing? You mentioned? Explain. Good, but why has it changed? Man, 
you steal my slides? That's exactly what I'm saying. Good. Thank you. This is good. Okay. So, see what is happening is, and let's, let's put this as a, let's, let's look at this as if we are solving a puzzle, right? So the first piece of the puzzle was whether data exists or not. Everybody in this room, based on the pop quiz that we did, agrees that the data is, is growing exponentially. The second piece of the puzzle is, if the data is exists, data exists, do I have techniques to make sense out of that data? And now you've seen that that also happens. The third is, okay, I have data, I have techniques, but now do I have the horsepower? Do I have the compute power to do it? Right? And the gentleman there said, yes, it does. Let me now try to elaborate on that a little bit. And Gigahertz is one example that I have also. Apollo. Apollo 11 mission, which was of course many, many years ago, the compute power that it had was 0.001 gigahertz, which basically is 1 megahertz. Okay, it had 1.024 uh, megahertz of compute power. Wouldn't you laugh at that today? Correct? I mean, 0.001 gigahertz in a system that took us to the moon, right? How much giga, how much, what, what do you think is the compute power of my laptop? Four, eight, sixteen? Four? Yeah, okay. So the lowest number, the answer is sixteen, because I know my laptop, okay. But the, but the lowest answer is four, right? Even then, what you see is, it is thousand times more. And that's just my laptop. Now, if you look at an institution like Balaji or look at any other institution, there is tons and tons of more compute power that is present. Like, I mean, exponential amount of growth in the compute power also. Right? Agree? So, everybody agrees. Good. Is that the end of the problem though? Is that the end of the solution? There is one piece missing. Money. Who is going to pay for it? This, what I just said only addresses the question of whether the compute power is available or not. But what if that compute power is very, very expensive and hence a single person like me cannot buy it and I, I need, we, need, we need an institution like Balaji to buy it. Is that true? No, that's not true. Today, hey, which way do I point this? Oh, it's this way. Okay. Uh, go back. Yes. So while the compute power is also very high, access to it from a monetary perspective is also very low. The barrier, the monetary barrier is very low. What I mean by that is about 20 years ago, if I had to build a big system, I would have had to buy the entire system either on my budget, and when I say my budget, not just me as an individual, but as a company, make sure that I had system administrators who would take care of, you know, uh, of making sure of admin responsibilities for that hardware, make sure that I had the cooling, everything lined up for that particular piece of hardware. Today, there are clouds. Amazon has it, Google has it, Microsoft has it, several other big companies and small companies are providing this cloud infrastructure. What that means is I can buy ginormous amount of compute power only for a day. Pause and digest what I'm saying. I can buy huge amount of compute power just for a day and not have to worry about what to do with it tomorrow. And I only pay for that one day's rent. That is where it is becoming more and more accessible. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All three of these things put together, availability of data, availability of compute power, and availability of techniques which help you go through that data, data mining and, and so on. All three of these things come together are really fueling the tectonic shift that you see in data analytics. Okay. Questions, comments? No? Good. Now, <clears throat> okay, but now 
some of the skeptics or the realists in this room may say, okay, this is all good, sir, but what is in it for me? Why should I learn it? Right? Or what should I learn in data analytics? Yeah? Any answers? Not you. You have answered quite a few. Uh, anybody from this side? Say it again. Good. That, that's, a, that's a good end result to have. But I'm saying what are the intermediaries that we need to do? That's a, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but I'm looking at something that is intermediate. Yeah. Good. So that, those are intermediate. Th th those are the final applications of what you want to do with the data. What I'm asking is, given this kind of a shift is happening in the data analytics world or data world or, you know, uh, what are the kind of problems that we as students should be paying attention to? What you said are the or what you have said are the applications that a business should pay attention to. What I'm asking is what are the kind of problems, technical, semi-technical, business that we as students should pay attention to? One second. Huh? Data categorization, good. Data privacy, very good. Somebody was saying something here. Authenticity. Okay, storage, very good. I'm glad you all are now thinking about these kind of problems because that that is exactly the new class of problems that have come up, right? And what that says is why on the first slide, if you were really a pessimist, which I am most of the times, I would be worried that data sabke paas hai, compute power everybody has, everybody has. Um, you know, access to uh, to good to to new age machine learning problems. Then the competition is going up. So what should I do? But don't worry. There are many many more problems to be solved, and hence the, there is a lot more to be done. The pie is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at some of these data capture. And some of you said authenticity and privacy and then so on, right? We all there is a new set of problems which is just around data capture. What are the ways in which I can capture data that is relevant, that is granular, and it provides for better user experience. I'll give you a very simple example of why user experience is very important. Hey, by the way, from a time perspective, see, I can keep going on and on and on. So somebody tell me, 7.30, that's an hour. So I have time till 8, right? Okay. Uh, I have I have uh, a dubious record of never completing my slides. So today I made 10 slides, I think, 10 or 11, and I don't think I'll cover all of them, but let's see. Um, okay, so data capture, uh, user experience. It's very important that you don't get too much on data capture and compromise user experience. I'll give you a very simple example. Okay. We, as we are talking, right, I mean, this is a dialogue. Now, let us say you are so... Uh, you know, you're very particular about writing down every word that I'm saying. That's, that's one extreme of data capture, right? So what would you do? You would just put your head down and write continuously what I'm saying. You will capture 100% of the data, right? But is that a good user experience? It's not, thank you, right? I will feel neglected, right? I, I want you guys to look at me, nod your heads, give me some some reaction to what I'm talking, what I'm doing, right? So, so you have, so in the real world also, on the digital world also, it's very important that you don't get to one extreme of capturing all the data while compromising the user experience. So that's a big set of problems that people are trying to solve. Yeah. Good. Data storage. Once you've captured the data, you obviously will have to maintain the privacy. So it's very important that, so that's why the, co the cost is in quotes. The cost is just not the monetary cost, but it's also the, the liability that you are incurring by storing more and more data. So that's why it's important that as a business, you decide what is the level of data that you want to store. As a technical person, you decide how do I store the data best? What are the kind of tables that I create? What is the kind of database that I use? What is the kind of data that really makes sense for my for my end goal and so on? That's another huge set of uh, class of problem that that people are trying to solve. 
uh, and there are tons and tons of use cases or case studies around around this also yeah okay data retrieval once i store the data once i capture the data and store the data i really want to retrieve it i mean the reason i am storing it and capture the reason i am capturing it and storing it is for it to be retrieved right imagine if i had the best mobile phone camera on my mobile which could take the take wonderful photos even in, even, even in dark lighting and so on but it had no app for me to thumb through my uh, my phone my photos that's a that's a really bad thing to have right now let us say i had a app that could thumb through my photos but it takes a long time to go from one photo to the other is that a good experience no it is actually worthless to then capture and store the data in those photos if you are not able to retrieve them right and hence there is a lot of work that is going on in this area of data retrieval now i am going to pose a question to you all and i think people from here haven't talked about anything yet so far the guys at the, at the back side can you think of one example real world example where data retrieval at a big scale is very important in near real time and you guys also start thinking okay no no you you still fall in this side sorry nobody okay go ahead nahi yaar bahut dur ki soch rahe ho very simple example see i i believe in simplicity simplicity is the most elegant thing to do think about very simple stuff that you and i do on a on pretty much weekly basis who said that good yeah 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 very good now we are thinking okay now think about something even more simpler that even simpler that we do on a one second one second guys good thank you so much irctc that is the best example we have ginormous amounts of data that need to be retrieved and has to be done real time how many times have we tried to do tatkal booking or iacity booking 8 am in the morning and uh, the thing is just scrolling you know going on and on and we don't you know we don't see the result and by the time you see the result the booking is closed very important thank you somebody else was saying something here banks very important example banks we are all very jittery about our money right especially if the bank now which which is the custodian of our 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 money if they don't retrieve our data in near real time and show us what has happened you know we we are going to be in deep trouble the banks are going to be in deep trouble so that's why even the banks which have millions of customers lots and lots of uh, you know high pressure transactions happening they also invest a lot of time money and resources in making sure that data retrieval is high quality is real time and you know is state of the art okay somebody else was saying something here wait i i i found some heard somebody here stock market. stock market yes very important stock market yes see a lot of these applications weren't as near real time uh, as they are today about a few decades ago but technology is making them possible data analytics is making them even more feasible yeah login credentials yes logging into any website or any of your systems travel yes i am so glad you are all now thinking of examples just last one here uh elaborate hospitals very important very important here good example thank you <clears throat> the real time is not as important as the authenticity and correctness of the data and the, the and the data being latest yes very important because there if the data is not latest a lot of long you know lot of decisions which may have long term impact may be wrongly taken yes 
party office. Voting. Yes. Good. See, now we are all thinking of good examples. I am so glad that. Aadhaar card. Okay. Guys, one last question and then I want to move to at least half of my slides. Yes. Google Maps. Okay, good, good guys. Thank you. Thank you. This is very nice. Okay. Yes. So, data retrieval is very important. Professors, please take note. And when these students, you know, come to you, give them problems around data retrieval a lot more than data capture or data storage. Good. Uh, okay. Bas. Data processing. This is when now you have all of this data that is being captured, stored, retrieved. Are we able to take all of that data and make some sense out of it? Right? My favorite example is IRCTC. When we do all of this, because I have suffered through it many, many times. The, so what is a good example of processing IRCTC data? Anybody? What does it mean to connect the, connect the dots? for IRCTC data. Okay, good. What is the even better example? Availability. Thank you. Yes. We are all there to see whether I will get my ticket or not in near real time. Right. So, availability. And so, connecting the dots can give you many, many applications. There has to be an ordinal ranking of those applications. That's again a very big area of research. There are, there's a ton of research that is happening in this field, not just from a pure engineering perspective, but the other extreme of pure business perspective. And when I say business, I'll talk about that in a minute, but these two extremes, right? One is a coder who is, who is coding without any, without any context of what the business is. The other extreme is a business guy uh, who is like the head of the, uh, you know, head of the organization and all he's interested in is making sure that the customers are satisfied that the, that the company is not making any losses, monetary losses, right? Both these extremes and everything in between is driven by connecting the dots and that is made possible through appropriate capture of data, appropriate storage and uh, retrieval of authentic data as well as in near real time or in whatever time frame that is, uh, that is expected. There was a comment or a question, somebody raised a hand and I stopped. No? Okay, go. How does all of this come together? Okay, did you do this or did I? Okay. <laughs> so, all of this comes together by what we say as data insights which are actionable. That actionable word is very, very important. Why do I say that? Can anybody guess? I can do. Uh, is there a time to guess? Yes. It's good. That's just that's just interpreting the the word actionable. But but give me something more. Please raise your hand and then I'll try to you know. No wait wait not you. Somebody somebody was saying something here. Raise your hand so I see who's saying. Then I can try and one two. Did you raise your hand actually before while talking? Who was talking here? Okay, so that person there. Yes, but why is that information actionable? I, I'm, I'm trying to stress on the word actionable. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 don't say those words. <laughs> Okay, that, that's the that's the dark side of it, but there, there are lots and lots of positive sides also. But but your point is well taken. Yes, absolutely. Is there some lady who who, who was saying? Yeah. Okay. No, what I'm asking is, what does it mean to have actionable? Yeah. One second. Yeah. yeah go on. No, no. The the, the gentleman there. Okay. Go on. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, good. See what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and then one last, and then I'll try to give some answer here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last, and then I'll hold your thoughts, guys. Yeah. Yeah, but what does it mean to say actionable? 
See what does it mean? Okay, if I say something, good. So you are all thinking about this, but when I do, and all of these are good answers. I'm just trying to push it one step further. By okay, one last, one last, and then I have to stop, guys. Okay, go on. Yes. See, what we want to do with all of this, I mean, I can give you some really bakwas insights, like uh, in this room, let's say I, you know, that the, the temperature in this room is XYZ, or the, the moisture content of this room is XYZ, and you'll be like, oh, wow, this is real good trivia. But what will I do with it? Right? If I give you something actionable in this, that will be the typical level of moisture that is required in a healthy setup is X, Y, and Z. Yours is alpha. To get from alpha to X, Y, Z, you have to do A, B, and C. Now that is actionable information, right? And so all of what you're doing with data analytics really boils down to saying something which is actionable. You are all trying to get to it, but this is very important, guys. That is the value of what you're doing. And I'm, I'm working with some of your seniors tomorrow to, to make sure that they realize also that data analytics for the sake of doing it is good academic exercise. But doing data analytics to derive actionable insights is really where the value is. Yeah? And actionable insights are some things, are things that an expert can look at and decide whether he or she should do the do the action that has been recommended or not because that's really where the value is yeah clear very very important this gets this doesn't get discussed as much as i would like for it to be and hence i thought i'll spend some time again thank you so much for being so interactive and you know giving your thoughts uh, all of them were very good very correct take it to the last mile which is making the data actionable okay please stop here what time is it now I, I didn't hear you can continue from any of you guys. Is that a, <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, I'll take another 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, yeah? 15 minutes. Oh, I have 15 minutes. Oh, good, good. Okay. Oh, man. Why did you click? No, no, go back, go back. Okay. Oh, but you've seen the, it's like, it's like a suspense movie and you've seen the last scene. <laughs> Anyways, pretend that you haven't seen and humor me. Now, from a, so now we've seen all the problems that can be solved as you know as uh, as the future MBAs and the future business experts and, and so on engineers and, and whatnot. But and some of you are giving those answers here. What is the fundamental shift that data analytics is bringing? What is it that we can do with data analytics today that we couldn't day couldn't do a few years ago when data analytics wasn't so accessible? Awareness, explain. Okay, so making good. So awareness, I'm interpreting it as making the making information more available more easily. Very good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Here, gentlemen, here. Problem. Very good, very good. So all right answers, yes, please go ahead. Good, good, good. That's the answer I was looking for. Well, that's one of the answers I was looking for. Good. At least you read my slide or, or you thought of it. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> go on. Yes. So, so we can now use that data for building awareness, disseminating information, for solving problems, building strategy. See, that could have happened even earlier. Do you think there was no strategy 20 years ago, 30 years ago? There was. Global reach? Do you think there was no global reach? Well, no. Do you think there was no cons consumer product 20 years ago? Time saving? No, no, no. Guys, you see my slide. How many of you saw the slide, guys? <clears throat> yes, the lady here. It was there 20 years ago. 
Yes, see that's the answer here. What's your name? Tanpreet. No, what, what did you say your name is? Harshpreet. Okay. Guys, when you give your answers, please give me your names also. That makes it, you know, I, I, that may, yeah. yeah. That used to happen earlier also. We used to have, 20 years ago, we used to have, uh, you know, uh, election results being predicted. That's happening today also. The big shift is, go to the slide now, is data? Well, we used to have, uh, we used to have a lot of data privacy in, you know, back in those days. Because the data wasn't available. The big answer is this. Yeah, go on. Yes, more accessible data. But what is the fundamental shift? The fundamental shift is this. We are going from being generic to being specific. What I mean by that is, <clears throat> I don't have the picture here, but if we, if we, everybody gets these Sunday supplements, right? Whatever newspaper you're getting at home, that newspaper has a Sunday supplement, right? Be it Times of India or Hindu or Deccan Herald or whatever. That Sunday supplement is large, yeah? that Sunday supplement is largely a advertise. Largely it's an advertise. Either about the new fascinating travel places that you can go to, the places that you can buy to go to buy clothes or vacations or you know buying electronic goods. Should I pause? Is something happening? No, okay. Um, right? But the way those advertises were given were generic. What I mean by generic is if the city is such and such, give this same set of ads. If the city is such and such, give the same set of ads. Do you really believe that all the people in a city would all like the same set of ads equally well? No, right? Now data helps you go from that generic city level thing to as granular as an individual at a particular time. So instead of targeting the entire Pune in a particular way, now you can target OM versus XYZ. Not just that, but you can target OM in the morning differently, in the evening differently, in summers different, a uh, different kind of uh, targeting, in winters different kind of targeting and so on. So the entire shift now is, and I think you were, you were giving that answer, is this has enabled a fundamental, <coughs> excuse me, a fundamental shift from being generic to being very specific. One very good example is healthcare. Where you, what used to happen and what still happens, but there's a lot of research that is going on now is a lot of generic medicines would be given. That this is a person, this is the particular, you know, dimensions about gender, uh, age, lifestyle, this is the medicine, that's it. Now what is happening is there's a lot of research in terms of personalized medicines, which says, okay, this is your lifestyle, but within that, okay, this is the kind of eating habits you have, but within that, these are the times when you eat, these are the kind of particular organic versus non-organic non food, spicy versus non-spicy and so on. And hence, the medicines are now being tailored to that level of lifestyle. So there is this big shift from providing generic solutions to very specific solutions. And that's why if you hear the word personalization, how many of you have heard the word personalization? Many of you, right? That is the big thing that is happening. That data is now being used to provide personalized insights. We haven't reached that stage yet. We are getting there, but, but that's a big fundamental shift that is happening in the industry because of data analytics. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, now, uh, as I was talking to uh, Isjod and Srishti, right? Uh, Srishti, sorry. They gave me some idea of the kind of uh, disciplines that are that are popular, you know, in this university. Uh, so what I thought I will do is, and I'll stop after this, although I have a few more slides, uh, is take three examples of, of some of the disciplines where you may think, yeah, data analytics has no value or data analytics is somebody else's job. I don't have to worry about it. 
and I'll, I'll give you, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll make this interactive and at the end of it, you will all realize that data analytics is really for marketing also, right? So who wants to take a crack of how whatever we have learned so far is of value for somebody who's doing marketing? Somebody here? Yes. Facebook and Google Ads. Very interesting. Yes. That's very good. Anybody else? SMS marketing, okay, very different, yes. Yeah, that's what you say, Google Ads, yes. Google Analytics and AdWords, very good, yes. One last comment, yes. Very good, very, very good. There's a lot of money being invested in figuring out who should be the brand ambassador for your product. Very interesting online surveys to get that data yes so see there's a lot yeah go on <coughs> market research analytics yes yes very interesting somebody at the top yeah specific yeah so again a hyper personal <coughs> hyper personalization yes providing marketing targeted marketing at a very personalized level yes very interesting so there's a yes Yes. So understanding the behavior of a customer and then using that to provide marketing strategies. Very, very important, right? So this, as you can see in the, in 30, oh, not 30 seconds, but in two minutes, we were able to come up with five or six different ways in which data analytics is being used, can be used for marketing. Very important, very interesting. Thank you guys. Okay, next. HR. Uh, let's have somebody on this side take a take a crack at it. How can how can <coughs> data analytics be used in the HR industry? Wait, guys, wait. Tick tick one, tick tick two. Okay, yes, there's somebody there. Yeah. So, be a little loud, na? So good. So whatever was happening on physical forms or through physical inspections, you can now do it in a digital way. Very good. Uh, somebody was very good. That's a, a, another hot area. How do you now do relative comparison? You, you please. Yeah, go on. I see. So employee performance. Yeah. So, so customer feedback can now be routed to HR. Yes. Okay, so job and personality fit. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. Somebody on top? No? Okay, good. Yes. Go on. Uh, elaborate. Interesting. Yes. Very good. So, as you can see, there are very diverse applications that, that you all have come up with uh, where data analytics can be applied in the HR industry also. Any last comments of anybody on the top? Yes. Say that again. Oh, okay. Yes. Good point. So, there is a skill set and then there is a job requirement. Can HR can then definitely use data analytics to try and do a, a matching of sorts. Yes, very interesting. Training, very important. Continuous training of, of, uh, of employees. Yes, so again the, the connection matching between the demand and supply. Okay, so employee career, employee career, career progression and so on. See, there are many, many applications of data analytics in HR also, right? Good, good. I'm glad you, you all brought this up. Then there's the last one. Operations. Who, yes. Forecasting what? Demand of what? Why is that operations? That's not operations. No, no, go on. I'm encouraging you to think a little more. Good. 
Thank you. So what he is saying, good, thank you. So inventory management is a big problem. Like you don't want to have dead inventory. Right? Data analytics can help you now predict what is the forecast for your product, in what regions and then accordingly manage it. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah. I don't have no clue what SOP is. Standard operating post. Okay. So establishing best practices from an operations perspective using data analytics. Yes, the lady had raised the hand. Yes. To do what? They got to do what? What in operations? Good. So you're saying Tableau is used. Okay, good. But to do what? And? Okay, so, so Tableau is used for visualization. So then you can use it to provide an executive summary. If, a, if an executive is short of time, you can use data analytics to say, you know, where the trucks are stuck or where the data centers are overheated or underutilized and so on. Very good. Yes, big, big value by the way in doing that. Huge amounts of money is being spent in, in just getting that information. Sure. Uh, supply chain and logistics. Supply chain and logistics. Another big problem that is being solved. Sure. Last, last one here. Budgeting, a very big point. Data analytics, not just in operations, but everywhere. A lot of, yes, good, good. So see, what is happening is ultimately two things that matter most to a company, top line and bottom line, right? And data analytics is being used in many, many different ways to do exactly this. Figure out what is the efficiency that can be derived across the entire value chain. Right, so top top line as well as bottom line. Very good. Thank you so much for being such a good good crowd in terms of you know helping me also answer some of these things. Very good. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll take five minutes. Uh, some learnings. <laughs> I don't have to stand here and do Google for you. Right, I and mean, you can all Google. So. So I'm going to show you that if you Google for advice to incoming students, you will get something like this. Next. To graduating students, you will get millions of, yeah, that many number of results. I don't have to stand here and do that. Next. Professional advice, again, you can go to Google. So there's no value that I'm bringing by giving you these three things, right? Instead, what I wanted to do, go next, is give you wait, some learnings that I have myself seen over the last 20 years, 20 odd years, and which I spent half an hour googling and I didn't find anything. So, hopefully there is some value in that for you. Okay, next. Yes, so do good work. You will find this everywhere. Do good work. Yeah, but what I'm trying to also say is add two extra things to it. You do good work and be ready to talk about it and be capable of talking about it. Two different things, okay? Being ready, what, is, what does being ready mean? What, is, what does it mean to say that I am ready to talk about my work? Having confidence and being, being, being a, ready to say. I'll give you, knowledge. I'll give you a, a funny story about this, okay? If, if you were me, if you, if you find it funny, then it's okay, but if not, you know, at least don't, don't throw tomatoes at me. Being ready is very, very important, guys. I'll, I'll give you a, a tiny story that you all may have heard. There is a farmer, okay, this farmer is really poor, has a, uh, has a cow which is very old and dying. Uh, there is hardly any food at home. So this person is basically, imagine this farmer who poor, the cow is dying, there's hardly any food at home and every day he's praying to the God that God, Bhagavan Bhala please help me. Every day he is doing that in the morning after, after having a bath. He also has a bad habit of eating tabaku. And so what that means is, you know, in our time at least, you get the tabaku out on your hand, get chuna, and you know, you sort of do this and then eat it. That's his habit. So, one day what happens is, this poor farmer with a dying cow, which is the only source of milk for him and all that, you know, no food at home, prays, prays to the God in the morning, in the afternoon, sits under a tree, for out of habit, gets the tambagu out, and now he's trying to get the chuna. 
वॉट हैपन्स इज ही इज आउट ऑफ चूना एंड ही सेज हे भगवान मदद करो एंड नाउ वॉट हैपन्स इज गॉड शूज अप एंड गॉड सेज बालक मैं तेरे लिए प्रसन्न हुआ हूँ बोल क्या चाहिए एंड वॉट इज द वॉट इज द फार्मर से चूना नाउ वॉट इज हैपन इज द फार्मर वॉज इन रेडी यू सी वॉट हैपन रेड द फार्मर वॉज इन रेडी so instead of saying yeah please give me two more cows or help me you know give me some money or you know some such thing which was which was something that he's been asking the god every day after bath because he was ready at that point he ended up asking something that was very trivial but something that was very immediate for him right so this is something that very important do not confuse urgent with important and that's what i mean by being ready a lot of the times in your life Uh, and i don't mean to sound philosophical or any such urgent things will take a lot more precedence over important in your mind just be clear about what is it that is important and what is it that is urgent yeah and that it's very important that you communicate be ready to communicate that and capability of course is you know just be good in your communication skills and, and so on okay good next network and get mentors everybody will tell you to get network what i'm saying is also get mentors this is extremely important that you have good set of mentors uh, why is this important why is this important uh, that, that's obvious right guidance okay but why that's networking connection networking yes that's guidance yes see what happened sorry somebody else was saying something i i'll, I'll cover that here huh say again i can't hear what you say the path okay so yeah others mistakes exactly so that's the point see our life is too short to make all the mistakes by ourselves right and that's where having mentors networking is very valuable because you can learn from others mistakes and make your own mistakes so at least be happy that this mistake wasn't made by anybody else we will all make mistakes but the only saving grace we should have is yaar ye mistake kisi aur ne nahi kiya theek hai so that's where networking becomes extremely important and getting your mentors okay yeah? and i can go on and on about that you know, how how what are the what are good ways of ment- of getting into a networking cycle get good way of getting mentors and so on what are some of the really bad ways uh, at least i have seen a lot of really bad ways in which people have approached me and, and so on but anyways one very important thing and this comes to the point about what you should do immediately after this what was the second thing that i said git git good so the first thing is uh, comes around uh, about this networking and mentoring is be very specific what i mean by that is and i'll give you an example of this okay let's say i went and saw a movie and somebody asked me how the movie was and i say the following three things i say the movie was good the acting was fantastic the direction was superlative can you guess the movie it can be many many movies right so what i'm basically doing is i might not have watched the movie at all i can still be saying this and i might be fooling somebody right the same thing is true about networking and mentoring if you go and say tell somebody sir you are very good madam you are really good in in your work if that sir or madam is experienced they will call you a bluff by saying be specific right and that's why if you are approaching any anybody a compliment or a feedback be very specific because it at least shows that you paid at least first level of attention i have seen a lot of people make that mistake where they just copy paste an email without getting into any specifics that's like a big no no even if you are really good and you make that kind of mistake with me totally turned off you're never getting any help from me so please be you know be very specific at least to the level that you can be when you're approaching somebody either in your in your peer group or for mentorship or any such thing yeah and that's a good discipline to have life long okay last get at least 1% better every day have you have you guys do you guys know about this phenomena yes no 
Yes, okay, good. So, let's go to the next slide and I won't talk. That's the phenomenon. If you do 1% better every day of what you were doing yesterday, that's basically compound interest, right? So that 1% goes to about 38 times what you had started off with. That's the exponential growth. Yeah? And that's not easy to do on a daily basis because at some point you will reach saturation. But the point I'm trying to make, and somebody else already made very nicely in a book, um, I think the book is called Atomic, uh, Atomic Gains or, or some such. Uh, I think it's called Atomic Gains. The idea is if you keep building even small 1% on a daily basis, the end result that you will see after a year or a few months is humongous. Consistency is really very important. So that's the message I want to give you. Even if you do small things, as long as you're doing it consistently, you'll be fine. You will be ahead of the curve. Okay, that's 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 pretty much it. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Any any other questions? Any? The floor yes. is now open for questions. Oh, really? Now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, guys, hold on, hold on. Are you, are you ready to leave? Okay, so go on. I saw an interview of David Icke, hmm. who is a conspiracy theorist, okay. on YouTube. Okay. And uh, I have read, uh, uh, so I saw a video, an interview of David Icke on YouTube, who is a conspiracy theorist on technology and the modern world. In an interview given to London Real, he stated that 5G technology can be used to manipulate human feelings and mood because of because human beings operate on frequencies, on different frequencies, and 5G technology can be used to in a very harmful way to manipulate human technology, uh, human uh, feelings. That's why because most of the people today are in depression, mood disorders, personality disorders, and all that. So. Uh, on one hand, 5G technology is uh, being uh, portrayed in the media as a very uh, bright side of uh, internet. But on the other hand, uh, David Icke, who is one of the most famous conspiracy theory, he is stating that it has such a negative... So, so what are your insights on it? Okay, so this is a bigger question. No, not just about... I, so honestly, I have not read... Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That, that, that is, and this question has come up in many, many different shapes and forms. Let me abstract the question out a little bit because I have not read, not watched that particular YouTube video. Okay. So the question, if I was to abstract out, is as the technology becomes uh, all pervasive, is it of benefit or is it detrimental to the human society? That's the question. Is it fair? Right. So the question is, as technology gets, you know gets all pervasive, we're carrying mobile phone all the time, we have you know all those smart watches and you know all sorts of our devices that capture our, uh, our uh, pulse rate and all of those things. Is that at the end, is it really beneficial or is it really bother, is it detrimental to us? My, my very simple answer to it is it depends on how you use it. And it may sound diplomatic or you know uh, trying to avoid the answer, but it genuinely is is the uh, is the correct answer. Also, I believe because see, there is a lot of uh, I forget the word attention deficit uh, thing. About ten years ago or twenty years ago, the average person's attention span was eighteen minutes or some such. Now that has come down to a few minutes, uh, like five or six minutes or some such. And that is being blamed on mobile phones, which is true. But what I'm saying is mobile phones are still passive devices. They are not, they are not coming and poking you to check, you know, check the message or any such thing, right? They may be making a ting noise, you can mute it. So if you really want to build your attention, what you can do is put it on mute or put it in airplane mode or some such, right? So the point I'm trying to make is technology has its own value, positive values. It brings in negative values also. We as human beings and more importantly we as society have to come up with some norms 
which will help us increase the positive value of that technology and reduce the negative value. One example uh, is what this institute does. It doesn't allow mobile phones, right? Some of you may think that it is draconic, but it's a decision that is made by the society, for the society of Balaji, uh, Balaji uh, Institute and hence the negative value is now zero. Yes, the positive value has also gone down because of that. But the net of it is that the positive just does a lot more than the, the negative that it would have brought. Does that answer your, does that, does that help people think about, about this question? Yeah. Just that point, I would like to say one last thing. Sir. Yeah, yeah. So in United States, they are in the United States and in London, they are introducing several uh, kind of boxes in streets and everywhere which would transmit 5G uh, waves all around. And uh, there have been many speculations that these waves will uh, deteriorate uh, the very social, the very f uh, fundamental human, how human works. Yeah, okay. And, uh, it will also help it uh, basically it, 5g technology is not uh, it's it's just a uh, you know thing uh, in front of us not it the, the behind the curtain thing is that it will be used uh, on a large scale for uh, uh, defense purpose right. and uh, m many speculations are there that it will uh, play a very big role in world war 3 so i just needed to know that yeah uh, so yes so the the next so having uh, having military muscle alone is not enough uh, from a from a from a security perspective technological technological superiority is very high yes in fact uh, uh, wait there is this you here brought up a very important point it, la, you know few generations ago or you know few decades ago the imperialism that you had was through military might. Today that imperialism is happening through digital means. Right? That's a very big thing. There is in fact if you google for digital imperialism, you will find a huge amount of articles. And that is true. That is that is truer and more immediate than you and I would think. Good point. What can we do? Uh, you know, government is government is taking steps. So if you look at our Aadhaar and data stack and all of that, India stack, there, there are ways to, those are some of our ways to protect, protect the Indian citizenship. Yes, Indian citizenship. Yes, yes, yes. Very important point. Yes. Uh, one and one. I mean, one and two, sorry. One. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Go on. So, okay, the, I'm not an expert on that card, but I'll address, I'll try to address the, the issue here, right? The, uh, and again, you should, you should look up India stack for sure. Everybody who's interested in the Aadhaar card or just what India is doing from a, from a uh, digital, financial digital, uh, you know, uh, transformation should definitely look up India stacks. It has brought in a lot of layers of security which now several other countries are trying to uh, try to replicate but yes there are ways in which information once given out can be replicated and easily shared with people who are not authorized to have it so there have to be ways in which not just not just a particular kind of information but any information that goes out even my email id your phone number you know people's salary people's uh, health records and all of that there are there is a big need to maintain privacy and making sure that the data is not transmitted without the person's uh, full consent. <coughs> I can't hear what you say. Yeah. Yeah. So there is. So. Yeah. Yeah, so there, see, there is always a valid point. So the, the point that I think he's making, I'm going to abstract it to another level. Again, very big debate going on in this field is how do you continuously 
monitor access to data and make sure that the privacy is preserved and the data is not, uh, you know, is not doesn't fall in the hands of people who are not authorized to have it. No easy answer. There is continuous amount of research that is going on, and you know, this will happen as long as data is is available. Yes. Somebody had a question here. And hey, when do we stop? Like, I can go on, but please tell us, Professor, when do we have to? Two questions. Okay. So, so two questions. One here, one here, and then we will stop, guys. Uh, my email ID is here. Actually, that's the first homework. Good. The so second homework is look at Git. The first homework is please write very specific feedback of what you liked, didn't like. Please do that. Everybody, that email ID. Okay. First and second, and then we will stop. Yeah. Uh, sir, I'm not from data science and analyticals, but I have seen that there is some security uh, which is in ITR when we open our, I mean, I, I, mean, I meant I have yeah. opened my father's ITR income text. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. So there's a security which comes and we have to, so what kind of security is it? Because I have never seen such security in other files. Right. So this is called digital signature. Okay. Who, who said yes, sir? Explain. Saves me some time. I will, I'm tired now. <laughs> he will explain. Mike, do you What's your name? Okay. Guys, listen, please. Yeah. So, in digital signature, we convert the message. <clears throat> that means we decode it and code it and decode the message. The, the the person who is sending the message convert that message into the in, into the language which digital language which which normal person cannot read it and send the message to the person to whom we are sending it and after sending that message the person use that pin code or something like that he will decode that message and the message reaches to that person so basically it is for the secure security and safety of the message and for information can be passed from one person to another person without any leakage between them so basically the idea is there is a whoever is sending you the document you have to be sure the document came from the authorized person. So the authorized person sends a particular passcode or a signature which you have to now verify is correct. Once that verification happens, you know the source is correct. Last question. Uh, there is no question from my side, sir. Okay. Uh, I am from commerce background and generally we, we believe in infotainment and all. As my friend has concluded, that 5G is going to take an overrule in everything. Robotics, basically what we have heard and read about from uh, timing, robotics, uh, robots generally are going to take our jobs. We know that, Facebook know that, Microsoft know that, everyone is talking about that. So, even the modern relations talk about that robots are going to take our jobs. We are going for a kind of holidays and our vocations and all. So, our bin, the modern bin, the bin of the 21st century, is all about spirituality because the jobs are not with us we are privatizing things but the jobs are not with us interesting let me that's that's a good point actually what's your name sahib beer singh decide okay so beer singh you made a very good point and that this is a good topic to end the uh, to end the session also on okay so the point you made actually multiple points let me try to see if i can address some in maybe two minutes the RPA or robotic process automation or just robotics in general is going to take up quite a bit of jobs. Yes, absolutely. And I would encourage that to happen sooner than later. I'll tell you why. A lot of these jobs are being done in, in environments where I wouldn't want my kids to go. I wouldn't want you to go or any of your friends to go. So as long as those kind of jobs are being automated, and given to robotics, wonderful, they are welcome, that should be done. A lot of the mundane jobs, like, you know, I got a WhatsApp forward one day, where this lady is just picking up the biscuit packets as they're coming down the uh, conveyor belt and putting them in, you know, uh, in whatever boxes. Now, that's a job which has been automated in many parts of the world. It, has, it, it wasn't automated in the particular factory where this lady was working. I would totally encourage that these kind of mundane jobs be automated and that's what robotics is doing today. Why am I encouraging that? Because as these jobs get taken away, 
there will be some amount of flux but a lot more new jobs will get created and we have seen this happen every time new technology comes people say Are, yaar, now this technology has come jobs will go which is true jobs will go but then newer kind of jobs will be opened up right like <clears throat> you had we had no no job title of data scientist let's say 20 years ago yes so we had, we had no jobs as social media influencers or data editors or you know all sorts of things so a new set of jobs will get created so the net net is yes as the old jobs get taken away or automated new jobs will be created final point is we need to move towards spirituality yes absolutely people have to and that's just not because of data analytics or any such it is generally true about the society that and this I don't want to get too philosophical but your, your happiness index is largely defined not by the access to technology or material uh, you know materialistic things that you have access to but to something that is deeper and, and I would like to call that spirituality yes very valid point thank you